Good morning, good day, wherever you might be, and welcome to the Dean's Global Health Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Sullivan Marks, and I'm the Dean of the Rory Myers College of Nursing at NYU. Today's lecture will be um, discussing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on a number of global health projects, stories from our nursing community, and how uh, a number of our faculty really worked together well to ensure that we could sustain global activities throughout the pandemic, and we'll be sharing some tips and lessons learned and look forward to the um, end when you will be having um, opportunities for Q&A. So um, one of the things I also want to mention is that this is the inaugural first in a series of planned Dean's Global Health Lectures. And so I thank you for being our inaugural audience from wherever you might be. Um, here in New York or at NYU around the country or around the globe. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Next slide. So um, at um, NYU Myers, which is our College of Nursing, we have a strategic uh, plan that we call thinking big or big, standing B for belonging, I for innovation, and G for global. And one of our strategic goals is that all programs at NYU Myers expose our graduates to global and global context of nursing and healthcare. Next slide. And here are many of our faculty who are directly involved in either research um, or uh, global activities and a number of our staff who help to put uh, this work um, together today. I wanna to thank uh, Hanada Kurtz and Carrie Stallonis in particular, and uh, Ian Headley who are behind us today supporting uh, this presentation. Next slide. So the um, summary of some of our global initiatives uh, stem back to an intentional way to address global research and capacity building, pro building projects. So we're really about the workforce and about how to understand uh, questions that we might have in research within a global context. So since 2010, we've had experiences in over 27 countries um, across uh, the world, as you see here, and we've had more than $25 million in funding um, and gift projects to that effect. And of course, we benefit at NYU from NYU being a global university. Uh, starting around 2010 to 2012, we really uh, took off around the world with um, what we then called a global network university. Right now, there are more than 15 NYU sites, three of which um, grant degrees uh, here in New York, of course, but we also have NYU Shanghai and NYU Abu Dhabi. And the core global capacity, um, global capacity interest of ours has to do with workforce development around HIV AIDS and infectious disease, non-communicable diseases, healthy aging, and maternal and child care. Next slide. So we also are very interested in making sure that we have strong local partnerships. And you'll hear more about that today, both with NGOs, but also with governments, ministries of health, uh, boards, and other universities so that we uh, can work together as partners and um, not um, just come in with a view of aid and assist, but come in with a view of learning. Um, and we have had a very important intentional global operations infrastructure within the School of Nursing and the university so that that really supports our ability to sustain our global initiatives. The university has an office of global programs and we have within the College of Nursing a very strong sustained office in that regard as well. Next slide. 
So what do these global initiatives look like? Some of them relate to direct research funding. Some of them relate to um, our own WHO uh, collaborating center in aging, which you'll hear more about today. And um, some of them have to do with sustained programs that began here in the US, such as our niche program, Nurses Improving Care for Health System Elders, that has gone um, globally as well. So that's an, uh, that's an important thing to understand that even uh, everything that we do, we put a global lens on it. Next slide. And so what you'll see today is both um, an understanding of how we work together through international engagements. We uh, focus on educational programs, um, global service with volunteers that then might turn into paid uh, employment. Uh, we have a variety of visiting international scholars and multi-year grant awards that have engaged, um, continue to engage our work, for example, in Rwanda for um, nearly 10 years now. So for today, um, what you'll hear is from our moderator, Dr. Sean Clark, and then as well from uh, three faculty members, uh, Dr. Robin Clark, Dr. Madeline Nagel, and Dr. Bei Wu, as two of uh, their individual projects with a focus on how did they keep this going um, and learn from it and, and gain traction uh, and uh, have good outcomes during the COVID pandemic. So I turn it over from here to Dr. Sean Clark. Sean. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Dean Sullivan Marks. It's my great honor to be moderating this uh, webinar this morning when our team of faculty and administrators overseeing Myers global undertakings got together to discuss how to kick off this global dean's um, lecture series it seemed only logical to put together a panel to showcase the impressive range of international collaborative work we have going on here at myers and it also seemed an obvious move to ground the discussion in the covid 19 crisis and its relationship to nursing we are going to hear three presentations this morning, um, and we're going to hear about partnerships um, of, of long standing um, that endured, um, that were built upon for years before the crisis, and uh, despite some abrupt shifts and, and some uncertainty, um, the, uh, the collaborators um, found special opportunities to shape projects and programming to remain relevant in the face of a global public health crisis. Um, we will be taking questions in the question and answer um, fields. If you want to enter them over the course of the presentations, we'll get to the end of those um, at the end of the, um, the presentations. Um, without further ado, um, we will lead off with a presentation by Dr. Robin Klar about a longstanding series of projects um, that are aimed at nursing and healthcare workforce development at, at various countries in Africa. I'll just introduce Dr. Klar um, briefly. Dr. Robin Toft Klar is a clinical assistant professor at the NYU Rory Myers College of Nursing. The clinical teaching and research arms of her career have focused on health promotion from a community perspective. Her work examining the environment um, has evolved over the years, going beyond air, water, and soil in terms of the environment, now to include the built environment. And her current clinical and research work focuses on the social and physical environmental impact um, on health workforce capacity uh, building in low and middle income countries. Um, so without further ado, I hand you Dr. Robin Clark. Thank you, Dr. Clark. So good afternoon, good evening, and good day, everyone. Um, I would like to share with you today some of our global projects, especially our nursing and midwifery capacity building projects that are occurring in Sub-Saharan Africa. As you can see from the slide in front of you, we have three projects of long-standing duration, our Human Resources for Health project in Rwanda, our Ghana Nurse Leader project, and our HRSA Resilient and Responsive Health Systems project in Liberia. Next slide, please.
So I'd like to start with our project in Rwanda and present to you the situation um, as it stood in March, 2020, and as it still continues to stand today. So at the current time, we have five visiting faculty um, hired by NYU Myers, and these faculty have been um, integral in the development of master specialty programs at the University of Rwanda, and also have served enormously in the new University of Rwanda PhD program as chairs and advisors. That has continued on. However, we have had some interruptions. One of our faculty members went home to Canada um, at the very beginning when she could still leave Rwanda and she remains in Canada. Another faculty member from Uganda went to Uganda for a short period of time and then came back to Rwanda about a year later. The current status right now is that all of the courses are being taught using remote platforms and there are a variety of them here. But what we've noticed from our colleagues is that Google Meet serves the student needs the best. While Big Blue Button may be the official platform, Google Meet is the one that serves them best. And starting this past summer, our graduate students are finally back in their clinical courses and we are very happy about that. Next slide, please. So the background of our project in Rwanda uh, prior to the pandemic was that all the faculty were teaching in classrooms and in clinical settings. Um, we were very fortunate, I was very fortunate to do an annual trip to Rwanda to work with the visiting faculty that are there, provide uh, supportive supervision, meet with, with clinical uh, directors, attend classes that the visiting faculty were putting forward, really learn a lot about the clinical expertise that our visiting faculty were, were building um, within Rwanda. Due to the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of uh, uh, Congo several years ago, we developed an emergency communication WhatsApp group, and that was a foreshadowing of this current pandemic. So what we have done is we've used that communication WhatsApp group for us to share information about the current status of the pandemic in Rwanda on a day-to-day -day basis with our colleagues. And I cannot thank our Rwanda colleagues enough for on a day-to-day -day basis updating us here in the United States about what's going on in Rwanda. Next slide, please. This is just an example of the daily updates that we all get. And we have seen these numbers start very slowly in Rwanda. Um, this past uh, summer, we've seen these numbers explode. And I'm very pleased um, to all my colleagues in Rwanda, in the country of Rwanda, to see that these numbers are coming back down again. Next slide, please. So the assessment of our current status in Rwanda was that we wanted to assure the safety of our HRH Rwanda NYU faculty members. We also wanted to support our, the graduate student progression. So um, as was said earlier, we may have been a little bit slow, but the progress was always there. Um, there were many um, adaptations, especially bringing everyone remote, um, but now we're working back toward face-to-face. -to -face. We really needed to assess the COVID vaccination status in Rwanda. We've all heard a lot about the slow pace of getting COVID vaccines to um, low and middle income countries. It is getting there slowly but surely. And we are informed constantly by our visiting faculty in Rwanda about that status. And I'm very pleased to say that all of our visiting faculty have received either the Pfizer or the AstraZeneca vaccine and have uploaded those data to the NYU system. Currently in Rwanda, all faculty need to show a vaccination certificate so that they can enter campus. Um, and therefore, because of this mandate, more lecturers are getting vaccinated now as they are around the world. Next slide. Our recommendations uh, for the Rwanda project was to extend the visas for our visiting faculty for humanitarian purposes, as all of the visiting faculty lived outside of Rwanda. And in Rwanda, they were doing a very good job of managing the pandemic. Um, and in their home countries, that management of the pandemic may not have been as robust. Uh, we are also pleased to say that the the student progress has been determined by both the university and what their protocols are, as well as the Rwanda Ministry of Health lockdown parameters, very similar to colleges and universities and how we're acting here in the United States. Next slide. 
This is an example, again, of some of the information that we receive on that WhatsApp emergency system within Rwanda. And this is the most recent from October 13th. And really just sharing with everyone one more time that the, the country of Rwanda, the Republic of Rwanda, is still in a, in a bit of a lockdown mode and it's very stringent, but these parameters have helped to keep those numbers low and get them back down again um, from where they were this summer. Next slide. Now I'll introduce our Ghana Nurse Leaders Project. In our current situation with SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, um, starting in March and to January 2021, was the Ghana nurses have continued with their quality improvement projects that they initiated upon their return from NYU. All the participants in the Ghana Nurse Leaders Project are registered nurses or midwives. So they've been working all along during the pandemic. What they've done is they've done some adaptations to their projects, being mindful of the um, importance of social distancing, the importance of mask use, um, while they're also providing care and implementing their quality improvement projects. Next slide. So the background of our Ghana Nurse Leader Project is it's one of several projects that NYU carries called Ghana Wins. Um, we are very fortunate with the Ghana Nurse Leader Program in that it is the only program within the NYU Ghana Wins that serves every single county in Ghana. Our phase two began in 2019. Um, we have this amazing collaboration with our, with our leaders in Ghana, both at the Ghana Health Services and the Dean at the University of Ghana School of Nursing and Midwifery. Um, our faculty went to Ghana in March of 2019 for the first of those two leadership training sessions. And then many of you hopefully from NYU Myers will remember that that contingency came to New York City and NYU in November of 2019, just under the wire of this current pandemic. Um, and one of the um, most innovative components of this cohort coming to NYU and, and NYC is that both the Dean and the CNO for the Ghana Health Services came along. The primary focus of all of the um, phase two Ghana change projects was on the adoption of the Ghana Health Services tailored documentation system. And we'll get to that in a minute. Next slide, please. So our assessment of our work in Ghana during the pandemic is that there needed to be an adaptation to the change projects to align again with their pandemic protocols. The site visits were supposed to be done by uh, University of Ghana faculty members, but they were taken up mostly by the Dean and the Chief Nursing Officer um, just to keep that social dispersion to a smaller amount. And the Chief Nursing Officer goes to all those sites as part of her work as well. Um, we celebrated the completion of the program using a hybrid attendance model. So all of us in, um, in the United States attended via Zoom and we participated via Zoom. Next slide, please. So our recommendations that followed through with the pandemic in Ghana, um, one of the most amazing and innovations and moving it forward, demonstrating what nurses can do both in regular times and in pandemic times is one of the change leaders, Henrietta Aquina, developed a discharge plan. It was her quality improvement project for the country of Ghana. But when the chief nursing officer, Ms. Eva Mensa saw her discharge plan, they implemented her discharge plan, her QI project as a national COVID-19 case management training session. Also um, accomplishments um, for this program uh, really saw um, an enhancement of the health service delivery in Ghana and the bringing together of some of those projects to develop new solutions. We've dissolved the current um, Ghana the entire Ghana Wins project, as a matter of fact, which included the Ghana Nurse Leader Project. Um, it was recommended by the Women for Africa Foundation as the funder, the funder for the entire program, Banco Santander, redirected its funds to the pandemic support within Spain. And we all remember um, where Europe was. They were at the forefront of this pandemic. And at the time um, when this decision was made, uh, really important decision to bring those funds back to Spain so that they could support the pandemic there. Next slide. 
And finally, um, our last project um, for capacity building in Sub-Saharan Africa is our HRSA Resilient and Responsive Health Systems in Liberia. We currently have two NYU Myers visiting faculty who were in the country throughout the entire pandemic. Both the schools of nursing um, throughout the country initially shut down, but they are now gradually opening and getting back to classroom and clinical rotations. And both the students and the faculty are very pleased to be back. Also, our visiting faculty are very involved and are in leadership roles and mentoring roles in the infectious disease clinics and the antenatal clinics in um, primarily in Monrovia. And they have really reduced the number uh, with these clinics have reduced the number of visits to support social distancing, along with the other slowdown in patients being able to be seen by primary care providers during the pandemic because of the importance of reducing the capacity to 50% or below. Next slide. Our background for our, our Liberia HRSA project is it's a five-year program really looking to revise the National Nursing Midwifery Curriculum, uh, developing, implementing, and evaluating uh, continuing professional development for registered nurses and midwiferies. We have a formal normal physiologic birth CPD and also an, a formal HIV care CPD for those targeted populations. Um, we are also supporting the health services in Monrovia, the capital city, as I said, around infectious diseases and antenatal care. Um, in, in previous years, we've had multiple trips to Liberia by the NYU Myers team, uh, but that last trip was in February of 2020. Again, just slipped it under uh, the, the radar for when pretty much the whole of the world was shut down around March 2020. Next slide. Our assessment of our work in Liberia was that all travel, as I said, has ceased to Liberia. One of the real issues was that there was a very limited supply of PPE and our visiting faculty in Liberia are providing direct care. So it became very important that we had the personal protective equipment available to them. HRSA thankfully supported this, this bit of a shift in funding and we ordered and have on, on, on site in country enough PPE, not only for our visiting faculty, but also for all of the colleagues that are working with them, especially in the infectious disease clinics and the antenatal clinics. What our visiting faculty discovered, especially working in the antenatal clinic in the infectious disease clinics, was that there was an incomplete knowledge a, a skill set and attitudes regarding clinic disinfection between cl client visits. And they have picked up the charge, served as mentors to demonstrate how to clean uh, the, the exam tables, the couches as they are referred to in Liberia, uh, between patient visits. Um, it became very apparent that the folks that came to clinic um, did not remember to bring a cloth to put on the table. So uh, the teams now have been um, educated and have implemented this disinfection process between client visits. We have had an amazing delivery of textbooks uh, to the schools of nursing in the midst of a pandemic. Um, it was delayed a little bit um, for us to get the books, uh, but it was an operational amazement to have all of those textbooks ordered from, um, from publishers within the United States. They all became aggregated into packages at NYU on 433 First Ave. And then they were shipped over to Liberia with an amazing presentation of those textbooks where the new ambassador to Liberia presented um, to all those that were the recipients. It was a very wonderful opportunity. Um, and we were able to attend via Zoom. There was a pause in our continuing professional development programs, but we have started them back up this month. And as a reminder that we have an occupational health and safety program, T42 Center here at NYU Myers, um, we have been very um, clear and thoughtful about the occupational safety and health for our visiting faculty and our Liberian colleagues during this pandemic. Next slide. Our recommendations were, were that the visiting faculty should be at the front of the line for the COVID vaccine. Um, the COVID vaccine was late in getting to Liberia, a little bit later than it was to Rwanda. So we were paying close attention to that because the vaccine came just as those numbers in Liberia were starting to accelerate. 
They have adapted their teaching and clinical responsibilities to support the uh, countrywide pandemic. Here again, we've used WhatsApp to create groups so that we could provide supportive supervision to the Liberian faculty. And also we've increased the supportive supervision for our visiting faculty uh, via bi-weekly bi Zoom meetings. And those meetings have been um, very important for um, us understanding as nurses and midwives, what the situation is in Liberia and how we can be flexible and adaptive through the process. We are continuing that purchase of PPE and we will continue the purchase of PPE until the end of the project in December, 2021. And visiting faculty have recommended to continue with clinical supervision to model that behavior to their colleagues and students in Liberia. Next slide. In summary, all three of these projects are longstanding and two of them have NYU Myers visiting faculty on the ground. Relationships, relationships, relationships. They were very strong before the pandemic and this has supported our contextually relevant adaptations. And also um, the partners have provided sustainable, uh, sustainability with the pandemic. And this one is amazing. The pandemic has actually accelerated the transfer of expertise and work to our local colleagues. Zoom supported long distance manuscript development. That's another whole story that we can talk about. It was amazing. And amidst the unprecedented challenges caused by COVID-19 pandemic, NYU projects remain on course due to the resilience of the teams. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Clark. Uh, we'll move on quickly to uh, Dr. Nagel's presentation. Uh, Dr. Madeline A. Nagel, board certified clinical nurse specialist in psychiatric mental health nursing, is professor emerita at the Rory Myers uh, College of Nursing and is internationally and nationally known for program development, publications, and policy implementation on substance use disorders and mental health nursing. Her activities include research and curricula integrating behavioral health into health professions education and practice, such as Project Serret, uh, a special NYU-based interdisciplinary program funded by the National Institute of Drug Abuse from 2008 to 2016. A leader in organized nursing, she's advocated for policy on nurses' mental health and consults and teaches internationally on substance use disorders and healthy aging. She launched the NYU Myers College of Nursing WHO Collaborating Center in Geriatric Nursing Education in 2004 and collaborates on education and research with Pan American colleagues and the International Council of Nurses. She was a Global Health and uh, Aging Policy Fellow in 2016-2017, served as Associate Director of the Rory Myers College of Nursing Center for Drug Abuse and HIV Research from 2009 to 16, and has been the recipient of two Fulbright Fellowships. Dr. Nagel's work has been recognized with numerous awards from nursing and interprofessional organizations. She practices as a psychotherapist and a global mental health consultant. Dr. Nagel. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Sean. Um, here you see our authors for this particular project. I want to uh, say that I'm very pleased to be here on behalf of Nancy Van de Venter, who's our deputy director of our WHO Collaborating Center, and to thank Dean Eileen for her support in the additional resources we needed to complete this project. Nazreen Nazia participated as well, a student from our NYU Myers group. And we want to thank all of our participants in the Eastern Caribbean. Next slide, please. So I'm going to highlight uh, this study because it really was a study that went into place around the time of the pandemic. And the SARS CoV 2 pandemic returned every region to a focus on infectious disease. In fact, the biggest problems in the Caribbean relate to non-communicable disease. And you see the very high rates there. This translates for middle-aged adults to high morbidity and high mortality in old age with high needs for levels of care that are expensive and really burden the workforce. This particular needs assessment explored the healthcare priorities for older populations. And we looked at it through the lens of the capacity to meet the UN resolution action steps. This is the decade of aging and central to these steps is a project called WHO 
World Health Organization, Pan American Health Organization, model ICOPE. The ICOPE model is evidence-based interventions for healthcare professionals to prevent slow or reverse decline in older adults. Next slide, please. So it's obvious that there is a lack of geriatric training for healthcare professionals in the region. This was articulated at the beginning of the study, which was not a new finding. We had some awareness, but you can see it was validated. Next slide. Um, the workforce factors that emerged in sharp contrast during the SARS COVID-2 pandemic really reinforced the limited flexibility within the workforce about caring for both the infectious disease onset and then the ongoing needs of older adults. As you can see, PAHO was very supportive in that region and provided certain needs to all of the islands and regions. But when the incidents rose in August, the burden was again on the, on the system, which was limited in terms of the numbers of registered nurses in the field and in institutions. Uh, the people in Jamaica like to say that they grow nurses in the Caribbean for export. But that also means there's migration from the region and they struggle all the time to have qualified nurses in place. They're dealing with a lot of vaccine resistance, uh, which has become evident through our reports in PAHO. Next slide, please. The methods of the study are detailed. This was a cross-sectional needs assessment and included 12 regions. And the framework was one that helped us identify the barriers and facilitators to translating evidence-based practices into new practice settings. Next slide. The data collection was a traditional one for the style of study. We used both small in group interviews and individual interviews. We had a lot of collaboration from local leaders, but few of them were nurses. And why is that? We reached out to a number of nursing offices. Nurses did not see themselves as being on the front line as providing care to older adults. They, their involvement has been primarily through institutions and low involvement in community as nurses. Much of the community care is delivered by trained, um, what we would call nursing assistants in the area. Next. In that data analysis, we wanted to identify the personnel, the resources, and the educational readiness to facilitate services that would move us toward the implementation of the ICO project and increase practices in healthy aging. Next. Our physical findings were not surprising given what we knew about the prevalence of NCDs and the extension of NCDs into older age. You can see them there. Uh, COVID rates were discussed by all of the informants. Rates were reported to vary across location, but COVID also complicated the existing difficulties of access of older adults to care because they were quarantined and limited in facility in movement around the islands. So the participants all suggested the need for education. If we can go on next, we'll look at the slide at some of those particular needs for older adults. Next, please. So the informants repeatedly cited the need to recognize cognitive changes and differentiate among cognitive disorders, and also to reinforce the acceptance of mental health conditions among families and participants themselves. Rates of depression are high there, but they have not been validated by diagnosis because stigma and tradition keeps the reporting of those conditions low. Even though they are manifested in the complications we see in physical problems and non-communicable disease. There are very few care homes that are run by the government. There are now several private care homes, but the data and statistics on those is lacking. So we don't have the kind of solid information about how care is provided to older adults with dementia and other cognitive disorders once they're institutionalized. A bigger problem is the failure to standardize care in those homes. 
And this was reported to us by most of our participants. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the pandemic highlighted the workforce limitations, both in terms of educational needs and numbers. It highlighted again the need for cross island and cross neighbor and cross region collaboration in programs and planning. This is challenging. The populations on the islands are small and yet keeping out COVID posed additional burdens on the health ministries and the, the social services facilities. Participants all identified the need for more education about healthy aging. While the Healthy Aging Program by PAHO has been recognized by most of the participants and our informants who were nurses, social service providers, physicians, everyone talked about healthy aging, but there was limited translation of the changes related to healthy aging and interventions to prolong life to practices on the islands. Next slide, please. So we're proposing uh, more educational programs to assist with the population in collaboration with our informants. They noted the fact that people tend to not plan for retirement, are limited in resources, and poverty becomes an issue for older adults. Many older adults cannot afford medications, for example. They're living on limited rates of pensions, limited subsidies. We need education on mental health in older adults. We need to build the capacity to disseminate information and conduct trainings, especially in relation to technology. Next slide, please. So clearly the value for global work to nursing and education within this particular study was highlighted. We were very grateful to have the work of our, our translator and our transcriber, uh, Nazreen Nazia, who worked with us closely. But it really indicated to us what other potential there would be to move projects in collaboration with our WHO sponsors into the region to develop geriatric training programs, which are lacking. The only geriatric master's program at the University of West Indies was closed because it was underprescribed. So we need to expand awareness of formal education for nursing workforces and social service personnel in terms of building more capacity. These projects, projects give us the opportunity for nursing students at all levels to participate in dissertation research, to participate in independent work and quality assurance projects and become exposed to the cultural public health health inequity and nursing workforce issues in the region. We were grateful to be able to use this beginning study, study and needs assessment, which will become a report to the Pan American Health Organization and a publication. But we'd also like to extrapolate from that potential projects where we could involve more students and faculty in this region through the work of our WHO Collaborating Center. Thank you all for your attention. I hope we'll have time for questions. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Thank you so much, Dr. Nagel. Um, before we uh, move into our last presentation, just a reminder that if you have any questions for the panelists, please put them in the question and answer box, which you can locate in the lower part of your screen. Um, Last but not least, we have the great honor of hearing Dr. Bei Wu. Uh, Dr. Wu is the Dean's Professor in Global Health at the NYU Rory Myers College of Nursing. She is an inaugural co-director of the NYU Aging Incubator. Um, she is an internationally known leader in gerontology and has extensive publications, close to 600, that cover a wide range of topics related to aging and global health, including oral health, long-term care, dementia, and caregiving. She has delivered presentations at hundreds of international and national conferences as an invited speaker. She's a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America, um, the Academy uh, for Gerontology and Higher Education, and the New York Academy of Medicine. She is also an honorary member of the Honor Society of Nursing Sigma Theta Tau International. Without further ado, Dr. Wu. Thank you so much, Sean, uh, for the introduction. That 
So uh, since the, the outbreak of the COVID, uh, I have been um, uh, working with colleagues from other countries to improve person-centered care and the long-term care across the globe. Also, actually, I've been conducting uh, studies to promote health equity and address health disparities in diverse population uh, in the United States. So that actually, since uh, March last year that I uh, have been delivered uh, I have delivered the 20, uh, 22 invited presentations uh, via Zoom or other kind of uh, online platforms because I'm not traveling. So among them, actually 14 were at the international settings that including actually organizations and uh, uh, universities host this event that from Japan, Canada, uh, Association of Southeast Asian uh, nations, uh, mainland China and Hong Kong. So the presentation certainly cover a lot of things that we have been doing in terms of uh, person-centered care, long-term care, policy development, uh, the COVID impact on oral health, uh, COVID impact on uh, mental health status in older adults, and also addressing uh, social isolations and the loneliness. Next, please. So uh, that I have, uh, this is uh, one of the, my recent publications uh, titled The Social Isolation and the Loneliness Among Old Adults uh, in the Context of COVID. This is really trying to kind of address this as a kind of a global uh, challenge. So uh, that, I, that this, is, uh, this paper has drawn a, a lot of media attention as well and has, has actually citation as more than um, uh, close to 150 citations already, just within a uh, uh, year or so. So that actually in this paper that particularly that, uh, that addressed uh, how actually using multiple approaches to, to, to decrease social isolation and the loneliness, think about uh, when is public health messaging, the importance of maintaining social connections, the role of volunteers, family and the healthcare providers, in, in helping old adults socially connected, the role of uh, technology in addressing uh, social isolation and the healthcare system's response to social, social isolation. Old adults is the one group that use the healthcare system the most, that it is really important for actually how to train our healthcare providers to recognize this, um, this issue. Uh, that actually there's very much a kind of public health uh, uh, pandemic to think about uh, this uh, social uh, the issue of uh, social isolation. Next, please. So uh, here is the AARP special report on COVID in the nursing home. The, uh, this report was published last January. Uh, the reporters interviewed uh, that uh, three dozens of uh, healthcare uh, uh, the, the experts and the policymakers and they came up with 10 steps to reform nursing homes. They called it the pass forward. Next, please. So I actually, I was glad actually the reporters took one uh, recommendation that is considered one of the 10 steps forward. Basically, quote unquote, that what I said is any plan uh, for improving nursing home quality of care has to address uh, isolation that needs to include measures of, of isolation and the loneliness, loneliness as a part of standard quality indicators. So uh, COVID-19 has really given us opportunity to pause and then rethink that we, how we improve quality of care for older adults. As Arthur Clemens wrote in his book, The Soul of Care, basically say nursing homes and hospitals don't, don't really measure uh, a care directly. We don't have direct measures to care. What we measure, we measure institutional efficiency as a substitute for care. Are, are, are they really measuring the, 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 the support uh, for kind of uh, the patients and the residents? We, we should directly measure the social and ecological kind of perspective. We have to measure communications between residents and their staff, the quality of their relationships, we have to measure the time spent to, uh, by nurses and the doctors actually taking care of patients instead of actually uh, as, as, uh, as opposed to looking at uh, kind of computers, et cetera. 
So I find this is kind of really interesting to think about rethink kind of uh, quality uh, of care measures at the, at the, in, the, in, the COVID, in the context of COVID-19. Next, please. So working uh, with colleagues from six countries, the United States, China, Brazil, Canada, Japan, and Sweden, we published two papers that particularly look into the impact of COVID-19 on social, uh, social isolation nursing homes that identify some innovative strategies from these countries to improve quality care in nursing home residents. So overall, we identified 18 innovative strategies from these six countries. Overall, these strategies aim to address these four areas. One is in increase, uh, so for example, virtual strength of fitness classes with family members virtually virtually the kind of uh, strengths and fitness classes with family staff members, et cetera. So the purpose is to increase um, resident social connection. And uh, another uh, uh, part is uh, uh, promote communication between family and the care staff or administrators. They improve physical fitnesses, support relationships between residents and the staff. This is very much what we are actually thinking about what I just said from Arthur Clements, kind of uh, the, the, the key point from his book to think about relationships, to think about communications, to think about how we actually promote uh, connections between residents and, uh, and the staff, and also certainly improve physical uh, 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 strengths of uh, individual. Next, please. So uh, that I uh, mentored my students uh, uh, from China and we, uh, we uh, particularly look into the person-centered communications between healthcare professionals and the COVID infected older adults in acute care settings. So we explore the communications between these um, the prof uh, professionals and the COVID infected older adults that in this uh, acu uh, acute care settings with interviews with physician nurses who provide direct care and the treatment for COVID infected older, uh, older uh, patients in, in Wuhan, China. So this actually is certainly this uh, quality interviews uh, with these uh, providers and the, the certainly that we found it is challenging for healthcare professionals to provide the care for COVID-19 infected older adults, especially for those with cognitive and the sensory uh, impairment in acute care set, uh, uh, settings. Facilitating person-centered communication is a significant strategy in response to the pandemic crisis and uh, a core element of uh, person-centered care. So we think person-centered communication can play significant roles in addressing challenges, building mutual trust, improve quality of care and the relationships, and the promoting treatment adherence and the patient's uh, psychological well-being. Next, please. So certainly when we're talking about global health, global health is also local. Local health is inextricably try, uh, tied to global health. That is a subject that has never been more relevant than today. To think about that, actually my colleagues and I that uh, recently uh, last summer, we wrote uh, a big center grant and the last month we received this NIH center uh, grant is called the Ruggers NYU Aging Center for Health Promotion and Equity. So this center will serve as a regional hub for researchers to conduct studies uh, on cardiometabolic disease, diseases and the mental health issues in Asians throughout the New, uh, New York, New Jersey, uh, New Jersey area. So overall this center is trying to create infrastructure to support high quality research on heart-mind connection through cardiometabolic uh, 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 health and the mental health, including cardiovascular diseases, stroke, and the diabetes. And it also provide annual funding for six pilot research projects to address these uh, issues and to conduct interdisciplinary projects focused on nutrition, emotional, uh, and the dementia caregiving interventions to target the diverse Asian population at high risk. And also disseminate the study findings to the local, regional, and the national levels to inform future uh, uh, prevention and intervention uh, research strategies. Next, please. 
So these are overall uh, kind of uh, what uh, that uh, our team uh, we have uh, particularly we have done uh, since the outbreak uh, of COVID. I welcome uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wu, for your presentation. And thank you to all three panelists. Um, we have a couple of questions so far, but we still have room to take others. Um, so please don't be shy. Please put questions in the chat. Um, so to the lead off, um, we have a question from um, Muzi Siwe Bengu. I'm sorry if I've mangled the pronunciation um, uh, from South Africa, uh, one of our faculty members from um, the Rwanda project. And she's asking Dr. Klar, if given that Liberia has the experience of, or had the experience of Rwanda under, or Rwanda, pardon me, of Ebola, I'm getting scrambled at this point in the morning. Given that Liberia had the experience of Ebola under their belts and coping with with Ebola. Do you think it was easier um, in terms of coping with COVID-19? Were they better prepared? Were they less anxious and fearful? And, you know, at this point, are they perhaps um, less resistant about the return to work and, and normal activities? Thank you, Dr. Clark. And thank you, Busi Bengu, for asking the question. It's great that you're here today. Um, I'm speaking from my perspective and what I saw. Um, we have two colleagues that um, may be on the call, but from what I saw, the experience of nurses and other healthcare providers working with patient populations with Ebola didn't necessarily make them um, less or more ready to approach this current pandemic. Um, this current pandemic's transmission is different um, so there was a, a, a need to train up regarding the transmission of COVID as opposed to Ebola. Um, there were other situations that were going on in countries. So some of those, those systemic issues going on uh, regarding um, uh, payment of healthcare providers that had an impact on our workforce. And uh, it, it, it really depended. I can't say that it was either better or worse. It was a different situation we had fewer nurses and midwives uh, that were uh, that met with mortality as a result of the pandemic, as opposed to Ebola. We know that Ebola took down nurses and midwives uh, predominantly at the beginning of Ebola in Liberia. Thank you again, Bussy, for the question. Awesome. Um, so uh, moving on to a, an anonymous question asking, uh, I think this one is directed at Dr. Nagel. Um, given that um, we are currently seeing a wave of COVID hitting Latin America and the Caribbean right now, and you know, we were seeing sort of geographic trends in terms of the movement around the globe of COVID and, and where, the, um, where the incidence is, is rising and so forth. Do you think there are lessons the Caribbean and Latin America are benefiting from in terms of what's been seen elsewhere in the world? So I think we, we work primarily in the Eastern Caribbean, but we have good communications, as you know, with Brazil. And we have been hearing about the lessons that they have learned in the management of the illness. For the Caribbean, a great loss has been the curtailment of tourism, which means their economies are being very negatively impacted. But the curtailment of, of tourism did result in keeping their incidents rather low. And because they are islands and separated from one another, they were able to manage that. Lessons learned clearly of the lack of an economic base to expand resources within healthcare institutions was problematic. The Pan American Health Organization worked to get PPE to all of those regions, now people do have access to vaccines, we're hearing more of that. But in many, many of the islands, they are very much in need of tourists returning. And even now, many, many businesses remain closed. Uh, there is still constraint for travel. Uh, what has been learned, I believe, is really the need from what they told us to be sure that education goes across the board to manage both onsets of infectious disease as well as continuing their work in trying to address the non-communicable disease epidemic, which has is, is been longstanding there. 
Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Wu, a question for you. Um, in terms of the projects that you've managed to keep going through um, this period and, and the opportunities that you've capitalized on, do you have recommendations for other researchers that are seeking to keep their work going at a time like this? Yeah, I think certainly technology provides us the opportunity to do that. So a lot of, you know, we have been kind of, our communication has not, uh, has uh, still actually the flow is, uh, is uh, flows well that we through our, um, our Zoom uh, uh, calls and you can interview uh, participants uh, by Zoom. So these are the things that, uh, that we, we can do certainly. That. Excellent, excellent. We have a question from Dr. Jasmine Travers from here at the Rory Myers College of Nursing, who wanted to hear more from Dr. Clark about the Discharge Quality Improvement Project. Uh, what did that project consist of exactly? And, and what do you think facilitated its uptake nationally? Um, how did others become aware of the project and what made them feel as if it was something that they uh, thought should be implemented widely? Um, thanks, Dr. Travers, for the question. The, the wonderfulness about the Ghana Health Services project was that it involved the Ghana Health Services, which is the health service system throughout the entire country. Um, and the chief nursing officer of the Ghana Health Services is the um, disseminator of all um, practice programs throughout the country. So she was able to disseminate this discharge plan to every single Ghana Health Services uh, hospital and clinic within the country of Ghana. Um, she was able to do the training on the discharge planning process, and it was, a lot of that process had to do with documentation. So it really started from boots on the ground, but then having a leader uh, within the system that could disseminate that new uh, discharge planning document throughout all of the nurses and midwives in the, in the health services system. Excellent, excellent. Um, I think we have time for one last question from Chidi Jaja from the University of South Florida. And um, she uh, commends us on uh, excellent presentations on health system strengthening and capacity building in low and middle income countries. And she asks, or uh, they ask the question, pardon me, I'm, I'm uh, unclear on gender. How do we address the issue of training nurses in low and middle income countries to serve local capacity um, when there's the, the chance that these nurses are gonna seek better opportunities in developed countries. Um, Dr. Nagel, Dr. Clark. Um. Yeah, I, I can speak to that because it's been a long standing problem uh, as we've heard from our informants in Jamaica where the government actually finances their education and then they take other opportunities to go abroad. Uh, what we've also heard from the nurses who are there, the support to continue their education is very important. Uh, this was a topic that we discussed among our network of Pan American WHO collaborating centers in this past week. How do we support our colleagues in schools of nursing in that Caribbean region so that nurses can stay there, continue on with master's degrees and have access to doctoral study? So right now we're working with WHO and Pan American Health Organization to support the development of more doctoral education, both in Latin America and the Caribbean region. Thank you so much for that um, answer. And thank you all once again for your excellent presentations. And thank you, the audience, for being present at this inaugural uh, Dean's Global Health um, Lecture. Um, we have been, uh, it's been a pleasure having you with us and we wish you a great rest of the day and we hope that you'll come back uh, to, to future, uh, future lectures. Thank you so much.